Let, let me welcome Elliot here to the stage. I think he and I are co-hosting this with each other. But this is really about him. Uh, it's about this book. If you have not got this book, if this is not part of your library, it has to be, and he's not paying me to say this. Th this book is an incredible personal account of the final days of the United States in Afghanistan. It's not just good history. It's one of the most meaningful expressions of the emotion that someone who paid a very dear price for our country on behalf of American objectives, and he personally paid, and he watched the collapse of our support for Afghanistan, and he and I watched us leave thousands of Afghans behind who we should have gotten out, could have gotten out, and didn't get out. So I think we'll talk a little bit about that today. It's really important that he give us a sense of, of why he wrote the book, how personal it is, perhaps a story of Aziz or one of the others. And I've got one I can tell you as well. And then uh, after we go back and forth a little bit, uh, I'm mindful of the clock here. I have 42 minutes and 26 seconds. We want to cut at 30 so that we have 15 minutes for you all. Uh, my name is John Allen. I spent uh, 42 years in, the uni in uniform, 38 years as a Marine. And I would serve uh, in Bosnia, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and then against the Islamic State. And I'll turn it over to Elliot, who would like to tell us a little bit about his background, which is fantastic, actually, but also to tell us why he wrote the book. Elliot. Thanks so much, John. And uh, is this working? No? No? Just knew it. OK, how about that? Here, we'll just, we'll just share. Um, it's great to be with you. Uh, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. I served in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan for eight years. Uh, also served as a CIA officer, uh, doing paramilitary work for a number of years. Um, and uh, now am a, uh, a writer. And uh, this book, uh, The Fifth Act, America's and then Afghanistan, is like uh, the general said, is sort of a chronicle of those two chaotic weeks uh, as Kabul was collapsing. Um, but the the title of the book uh, really originates is, as everything was starting to implode and Kabul fell, a, actually a friend of mine who's a book editor reached out to me and she said, you know, Elliot, could you, I'm gathering up some people to write essays about what's going on in Afghanistan because people just haven't been paying attention to this for so long and they're trying to wrap their heads around everything they're seeing on the news. Could you in maybe 400 or 500 words just summarize what's gone on there in the last 20 years? I'm like, I like to think I'm a pretty good journalist, but I was like, I don't know if I'm that good of a journalist. And I was watching this with a lot of emotion myself. And then she said to me, well, you know, people are just looking at this and they just know that it's a tragedy. And it was her use of the word tragedy that not only allowed me to finish my small 500 word writing assignment, but to also start to understand what would be the conceit of this book, which is tragedies are typically told in five acts. And so the structure of this book is a five act structure. The presidencies of Presidents Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden. And then the fifth act becomes the sort of tragic denouement, which is what happens uh, with the end game and the Taliban. Um, the five act structure also s takes you through five cases that I was involved with of our allies trying to get out over those very chaotic weeks. And sort of the last narrative arc of this entire book is, is so many of us you know, whether we were military veterans, journalists, people who had worked in Afghanistan, even humanitarian activists, were scrambling in those days to just get everyone out. There was sort of this moral underpinning to all of it. This is why was everyone who hadn't, you know, many of us who hadn't been involved in the world like myself for a decade, been a decade since I've been in Afghanistan, so urgently trying to make good on this. And I would say it comes down to this idea that I know, you know, obviously you're very familiar with, I'm very familiar with it, it is that we don't leave our people behind. It's foundational to everything we do in the US military. We don't leave our people behind. And I would argue that that's not something that is even unique to the US military. It's actually a concept that goes back to the, to the most ancient stories we tell ourselves about war. I mean, for instance, if you look back at the, at the Iliad, you know, Homer's story of the Trojan War, the way the Iliad ends is after Achilles kills Hector, the Trojan prince in front of the gates of Troy, you may recall he ties Hector's body to the back of his chariot, drags his body around the walls of Troy, and then brings it back to his camp. 
And so the final scene of the Iliad is King Priam, the Trojan king, sneaks into Achilles' camp, and he begs for the body of his son back. And that's how the Iliad ends. Why does he do that? Because we don't leave our people behind. And so as all of this was playing out in Afghanistan in those weeks in 2021, there was also, I think, a real psychological urgency to it, particularly for so many veterans of that war, which is how do we make good on that promise, knowing full well as the gates of the airport are closing that we're not going to be able to make good on that promise and that so many people are going to be um, left behind. And I would just add on that sort of our connection or my connection to General Allen, I was sort of thinking as we were coming down, I was like, how do, how do I know General Allen? And um, I was like, geez, it really kind of goes back a long way. So for instance, I guess I would say I first know General Allen because he was the CENTCOM commander when I was a very, very lowly captain uh, working in Western Afghanistan as a special operator. And then many years later, we met one another in, in Washington, D.C. And he kindly asked me out for a cup of coffee and we sort of were able to compare our wars many years later as we were both outside of them. And then during that chaotic summer as veterans like myself and others were just scrambling to figure out who could help us you know, get busloads of people into the airport at Kabul, uh, I found myself on the phone again uh, with General Allen and I was among the many groups of people that he was trying to help in those chaotic days. And so people have sometimes asked me, you know, what was the war in Afghanistan? You know, what word would you use to describe it? And the word I've always settled on is collapse. Um, it was a collapse of American competence that we all saw. It was a little bit a collapse um, of time and that so many of us were thrown back into a war we thought we'd left a long time ago. You know, answer I'd say it was a collapse of hierarchy because I found myself in the trenches with the likes of very senior commanders from retired four-star flag officers, um, people like yourself and Admiral Mullen down to lowly captains and gunnery sergeants who'd fought this war, all sort of bounded by this thread that is, it's an experience we shared together at the end trying to make good on this. And I, I thought maybe I, I, you know, in my long soliloquy, um, but asking you a question that I've gotten a lot uh, as I speak about this issue is sometimes people say, make the point, well, there was no other way this could have ended. What do you, what do you think about that? There were many other ways this could have ended. It didn't have to be this way. <clears throat> you know, we made several decisions. Uh, just as context, I commanded the war uh, at its height. So I had roughly 148 or or so thousand uh, U.S. and NATO troops. Uh, my responsibility also was the 302,000 uh, Afghan army troops that we were just beginning to move into the fight, about 100,000 police. Uh, I worked every single day with the CIA, with National Security Agency. It was a much bigger war than a lot of people thought in terms of the, the, the context. There's a CIA officer in here. I shook his hand a little while ago. Um, he and I uh, know a lot of folks that, uh, that, that paid the price that the CIA was right alongside us shoulder to shoulder. And the, the challenge that we had when President Obama brought me into the Oval Office and gave me the command, he said, you've got to pivot the war. I took command of the war at exactly the 10-year point. You've got to pivot the war. This has got to be a war that ultimately ceases to become a NATO war where we're in the fight every single day leading combat operations to one where the Afghans ultimately take over the war. And I remember my very first briefing to all my general officers after I took command. I said, ladies and gentlemen, we got 40 months to go from 150,000 allied troops spread out around 800 plus bases in Afghanistan down to about 12,000 troops on 10 or 11 bases. We got 40 months to do that and in the process get the Afghans into the lead. Well, we decided to compress that timeline. And we did not have to do that. There was no requirement to do that. You know, people say, well, how long were you going to stay? And my response was, I don't know how long we're going to stay, but I know that our staying longer gives this fledgling government an opportunity to create a stability that ultimately can get the economy going again, get entrepreneurship, get the women involved. The des country desperately need to have women involved. But we came down too fast and we ended up too few. And that was a recipe, ultimately, for the instability that occurred 
which created the collapse that we all experienced in August of 21 or 22. And the, the challenge that we had, and this is where Elliot and I, uh, our lives intersect, I think, pretty dramatically, was there wasn't, really wasn't an operation that we went on, whether it was the CIA up on the border with uh, Pakistan and the CTPT units, which were, there's no history written on them yet, and there, that will be an interesting history to marine uh, patrols or uh, down in, in uh, Sangin River Valley, or the army in the, in the east, or the Germans in the north, or the Italians in the west. There was almost no patrol that went out that didn't have an Afghan along on that patrol who spoke that language and interpreted the environment for our troops. And they numbered in the thousands. We fought there for 20 years. They numbered in the thousands. And we, at least America, and I, I know many of our allies said this as well, you served alongside us. Often they were killed. Often they were wounded. And I'll tell you about Saber Rock here in a minute, who was one of the interpreters I got out. We owe you something for that. And we have this thing called a special immigrant visa, an SIV. And if you apply for an SIV, you and your family can come to America, and you can put down roots here, and we'll take care of you. Well, we never created the system necessary to process the SIVs. And they were backed up by the thousands as this began to come apart, as this began to come apart. Now, I'll tell you how this plays out, though. I uh, attended uh, an event with a Harvard pol political science department uh, club of students. <clears throat> so these Harvard students would come together periodically to talk about political science. And they were evidently clearly bored because they invited me to come talk to them one day. And this young woman introduced me. And I recognized her name as being an Arabic name. And I said, tell me your origins, because she spoke unaccented English. And she said, I was carried in the arms of my parents out of Iraq, where my father was an interpreter. And he came out of Iraq on a SIV, special immigrant visa. So here, this, the next generation of our, not just that country, but our country is being determined by a young woman who came out of Iraq as a baby in the arms of her father, who was an SIV recipient, and now she's a student at Harvard, for God's sake. Now, you, you'd have thought we'd have wanted to supercharge this SIV problem, get this, doing, get this going, and I think we're trying harder now. But where Elliot and I found ourselves in the, that awful month in August when it was coming apart was getting phone calls and emails almost 24 hours a day with people begging us personally over the phone to get them out because the Taliban was now hunting them. And if you were National Directorate of Security, the Afghan CIA with, with whom Elliot worked very closely, or you were Afghan special operators, or you were Afghan special police, if the Taliban caught you, you'd be killed on the spot. And if you caught, were caught with their family, you'd be, they would be killed on the spot. So this was a desperate moment. And this young man wrote a book that pours his emotion into this. This is why you've got to read it, because it's not just about the history. It's about how someone whose life and operational effectiveness was defined by these interpreters, how we felt at that moment when we couldn't get them out. Two very quick stories. One was this youngster I said I got him out, Saber Rock. He was on a patrol with Marines in Helmand province down in the south. As was often the case, the patrol got ambushed. Marines are in the kill zone, and they're down hard. Now, Saber Rock is an interpreter. He's not a combatant, although he carried a weapon. He goes into the kill zone to start dragging wounded Marines out of the kill zone. He's shot in both arms and shot in the face and loses three fingers on his hand. And he still goes back into the kill zone. Now, I got him out. As this is, un as this is collapsing in, in Afghanistan, I get a call from him. His two brothers were also interpreters. They're desperately trying to get out now. And we tried very hard to get them out. I wrote letters on their behalf. We forwarded them to CENTCOM. They were sent it forwarded down, got them into the hands of the kids. They were showing them at the gates. They couldn't get through the gates around the airport. His two brothers were sitting on a bus watching the last airplane take off. You can imagine the frustration that we felt. I'll turn it back to you for your, some of your thoughts. I, um, I, have, I, I have similar stories. You know, I, Walking away from what happened in Afghanistan, I think it's it's very uh, it's very easy for me to feel bitter about that, and um, 
and all of these stories. But there is something that we can do right now that, frankly, I think many Americans just don't even know is going on in the background, candidly. And one of the things that is always sort of remarkable about engaging with Afghanistan is just how far it's fallen out of our national consciousness. Um, so, for instance, we did get out about 70 to 80,000 uh, of our allies from Afghanistan, and they were brought to the United States, and we all saw those images. And when they were brought here, they were brought here under what's called humanitarian parole. So they are able to stay in the United States for two years. Now, without special exemptions, they're not able to get green cards and work, so they can't get a car, they can't sign a lease on a home. You know, many of them are struggling. And unless their status is adjusted, at the end of those two years, they will be sent back to where they came from. So in this case, that is Taliban-led Afghanistan. I, don't know, I say this to most people, they sort of blink, they can't even believe it. This is true. There is bicameral legislation in the House and in the Senate that has been go ongoing for the past year plus called the Afghan Adjustment Act, which would adjust their status it would increase their vetting, so everyone would be re-vetted and have their status adjusted, and then put our allies on a pathway to get the green cards and to earn citizenship. That legislation was in the last Congress. It did not pass. Did not pass. The day that the Afghan Adjustment Act was finally dead on arrival, and it didn't pass, not because of, not because, it wasn't because of Republicans, it wasn't because of Democrats, it was because of both. Neither, neither sides wanted to necessarily touch it. To be brief, Republicans don't, generally didn't like it because it's an immigration issue and that can be politically a liability and the Democrats didn't want to champion it because it resurfaces Afghanistan, which is uh, a liability, at least for the administration or some field. Um, but anyways, the day that it was announced that the Afghan Adjustment Act did not pass was the day before President Zelensky arrived to give his speech to a joint session of Congress. This is a very divergent split screen as to who we are as Americans, how we treat our allies, and what, our, our, what type of vision uh, we are projecting to the world as allies. And I think it's very important that as a country, we not just stovepipe Afghanistan as this single issue we're trying to necessarily you know, sweep under the rug and move on from. And if there's one thing I've learned uh, as a student of history, uh, and a participant of those wars is, you know, we might be done with Afghanistan, but Afghanistan isn't done with us, and there are still things we can do to rectify some of the damage that was done in the summer of 2021. And I think that, uh, as Elliot has said, it, it, if you're interested, uh, you can find ways to help. I met a gentleman a few minutes ago, and I, I'm sort of looking at him now. He may not want me to raise his hand, but uh, he's involved in helping to get Afghan families settled. And our culture, in many respects, is very different than the Ukrainian culture, for example. We went through this, I'm old enough to remember Vietnam. And all we went through to settle the Vietnamese, or the Hmong tribe out of Laos. And the difficulties they had coming to America, but then we found that local Americans and local communities embraced them and gave them a place that they could ultimately call home. Now, I don't know why the Hmong from Laos ended up along the Canadian border. It was a lot colder than they were used to. But they have thrived there. And a daughter of the Hmong received a gold medal in the last Olympics. An American. She's proud of it. So this is about our future. We should look in the mirror when we want to know how we should treat the Afghans. It's not about the Afghans. It's about how we as a people, a, 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 a principled people, we'll treat those who are less fortunate than ourselves. And as Elliot said, look, we got thousands of people out, but we left thousands behind. And there is room for us, first, to be conscious of it, and second, to see if there can be a personal investment, at least of time, maybe even some money if you wanted to contribute. And I'm not, not even suggesting that. But there is much more still to be done. And I think that as we continue, my hope is that uh, there will be greater emphasis on the Adjustment Act as opposed to less, depending on how the war goes in, in Ukraine. Ron, I was hoping you could talk a little bit, because we're, you know, we did address Ukraine. 
I found that the, the sequence of events from August of 2021 when Kabul collapses to February of 2022 when Russia invades Ukraine to be at least geopolitically dizzying the amount that was going on. And I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit, sure. whatever nexus you, you see there or don't see there. Well, you, um, you don't look at the Russian acts as, as, as independent of each other. Uh, so we see the red line on the Syrian use of, of uh, nerve agents on the Syrian population that we did not punish the Syrians for doing in, in August of 2013. 2014, we see the Russians invade Crimea. A sense of whether we're prepared, if we're not prepared to back up a red line, then the hybrid operations the Russians used to take over Crimea were fine. 2015, we see the Russians in Syria. I was the president's special envoy at the time for the to fight the global coalition, or with the global coalition to fight ISIS. We watched the Russians come into Syria a little bit at a time, and then suddenly they're there, and we're pulling out. Uh, this is also after the Russians invaded and took a big chunk of Georgia in 2008. All of these events are related. These are not single, solitary uh, motivations coming out of the Kremlin. And so when the United States, after 20 years in Afghanistan, is unwilling to put the kind of combat power as necessary to sustain our long-term presence there to create the stability necessary so Afghanistan can stand on its own, it sends a pretty clear message as to what it is we're prepared to oppose with respect to aggression. And sadly, uh, we saw the ultimately the, uh, the manifestation of a Russian-Chinese relationship on the 4th of February of 2022, where they see the world in an entirely different world uh, manner than we do. They use the same words about being committed to human rights and sovereignty and democracy, but their perversions of those words are completely different than ours. Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin signed this agreement in Beijing on the 4th of February, and 20 days later, the tanks are rolling. Putin would not have run those tanks if the United States had stayed in Afghanistan. I absolutely believe it. Or if we'd have fought our way back in to take charge of the situation. Now, you may not agree with me, and that's fine. But I've been watching this for a little while. And, and I happen to say, think that how goes Ukraine, so will go Taiwan. I mean, these are all related events. They're not singular pieces of history. Elliot's a, a student of history, and, and he sees, I think, the connectivity between these. And we have to take the long view. And how we are viewed as a people and how we reacted at that moment in time when we had this crisis, I think, is important. And many will judge us harshly on this, even though it was the largest airlift of refugees ever conducted by any country in the history of the world. OK, I'm all about that. Thank you. Well done. Well, we left a lot of people on that runway watching the last airplane take off that should have gotten out. And I would add, I think, you know, one of the things that has interested me a great deal in the evolution of 20 years of war are the stories that we are, the narratives that we are telling ourselves about these wars as they go on. So, you know, sometimes people have asked me, um, you know, where were you on September 11th? Because you know, that was a, a defining event in my life. And I've always gone back to not where I was on September 11th, but what I was doing on September 9th, 2001. Uh, and September 9th, 2001, I was at the time an ROTC student hanging out in a gymnasium, not much, very similar to this, getting ready to go into the Marines. And September 9th, 2001, I had requisitioned the television in my apartment for my brother because I wanted to watch this TV show that was premiering that night. And that show was Band of Brothers on HBO. There you go. And... I only bring that up because if we look, think of it as a barometer, you know, where was, where was the zeitgeist in the United States? What, was the what were the stories that we were telling ourselves at the moment 9-11 happened? It was these greatest, you know, these stories of this greatest generation, this sort of nostalgia for fighting a war in which we're the good guys, uh, we are the liberators. And then September 11th happens, and I would argue that the country was, was primed at that point to go and fight a war. But then what was the war that we wound up fighting? Well, if you remember, President Bush you know, gave his iconic speech to, to Congress two days later, talking about how this would be a new kind of war fought in the shadows. You know, Its victories are not going to necessarily be announced in the same way. And he was, I think, very prescient in saying that, because the war on terror looked different. 
but very shortly thereafter, we wind up fighting two other wars, or technically their operations under the larger rubric of the war on terror, which is the invasion of, of Afghanistan and then later the invasion of Iraq. And those are two wars that are very familiar to our American minds, right? If the war on terror is predicated on preventing a negative from occurring again, right? You win if there's not another terrorism attack. So how do you ever really know if you're winning? You're winning if something's not happening. These other wars look much more familiar to us. They're sort of like in this Second World War rubric. We now are the liberators. We are invading Iraq to liberate it from Saddam Hussein. We invade Afghanistan and try to rebuild it to liberate it from the Taliban. And we go down these very different paths to get to the point where we're at 20 years later, where we're talking about how do we end the war, right? We need to end the war. The troops have to come home so that the war can end. And and I'd be interested in your views on this, because I've always had a hard time with it. I'm like, well, OK, I'm, I'm all for ending wars. But when I look back at history, you know, the troops don't all come home when the war ends. I mean, after World War II, the troops all didn't come home. They didn't come home from the Korean Peninsula. Um, you know, in many ways, the only time the troops, all the troops come home at the end of the war is like in Vietnam, when we lose the war unequivocally. Um, so it's this question of how do you how do you end a war? And then we look at wars. I think one of the sort of the things that is, is bitter is that Afghanistan was always the good war. But it is the war that we have clearly and unequivocally now lost. Whereas if we look at Iraq, where I also fought, which was the bad war, I wouldn't go so far as to say we won the war in Iraq. But I would definitely say there's a little bit of a mixed outcome there. And strangely enough, you know, we still have about 900 troops in Iraq. And I think 300 in Syria. Secretary Austin visited Iraq two weeks ago. Does troops still draw imminent danger pay? I would ask the question, are we at war in Iraq still? And if we are, why didn't we need to end that war? And if we're not at war in Iraq, could we have found a way to not be war in, at war in Afghanistan and still not lose in such a catastrophic manner? So I just would be interested in anything yeah. you have to say about ending wars. Yeah, I draw the distinction between the end of a war and the end of a conflict. And the conflicts typically are broader society on society adversarial relationships. The war is often portrayed as the, as the kinetic moment within a conflict where actually fighting and dying and killing occurs. And we often become confused at a policy level that if we have ended the war, we've ended the conflict. And we become confused by thinking that if we stop fighting, somehow the war has stopped. Well, in this case, the war both didn't stop and the conflict continues. Now, we haven't yet seen an attack that emanates from the safe haven of a Taliban-controlled uh, emirate, Islamic emirate of Afghanistan upon our allies or upon the United States, but it's coming. It almost certainly will occur in the future at some point. Um, so I, you know, I've got serious concerns. I'm, the, as we think about conflict, as then we think about the war dimension of the conflict, we have to think very seriously at the strategic level about what the war termination measures are that we want to think about. You think about that before you start fighting. What do we want the war to look like at its conclusion, and how does that flow into the period of conflict where we stabilize and where we ultimately hope to recover the, the social fabric, whatever it might be, the create humanitarian conditions? But it's not as simple as just bringing the troops home. And I got a phone call two nights before President Biden announced the, the final review from a senior person in the administration saying, I got to brief you on the decision. And I won't take you through all of it, but I, I did make a comment, and I'll make this comment here. Uh, my, my sole following comment, first one I said is, don't you tell anyone that I supported this decision. I'm glad you informed me, but don't let this conversation appear to have been my having been informed and supporting it. I said, what are we going to do about the women of Afghanistan? One of the most important dimensions of the command that I led across the entire country was, regardless of whether you had a German flag on your shoulder or an Italian flag on your shoulder or the Eagle Globe and Anchor over your heart or you were an army unit in the east or you were CIA working with the folks, a lot of what we did attempted to create the conditions within society so that women had the capacity to thrive. And I can't tell you how many times my conversations with Hamid Karzai, I said, you don't have a prayer of emerging from being a conflict society into a developing society unless you bring women into the mainstream. And frankly, that had been one of our principal objectives. Defeat the Taliban, stabilize the environment, create the capacity for the country to begin to develop, and include women in the process. <laughs> and of all the things I'm most frustrated about, 
is the sense that somehow the Taliban would respect the American, Western, European view of how women should be treated in the post-departure. And I think if you've been watching the news or reading anything, women went from some semblance of a role in society to now being completely disenfranchised. It's exactly how we believe. The Taliban weren't 2.0 coming into the presidential palace in 2022. They were Taliban 1.0. They can't change it. It's not in their DNA to change their view on these very deep folk religious issues associated with the nature of how they practice Islam. I know a little about Islam. And they're not going to change. And we are now stuck with the reality. Do we have a relationship with the Islamic Arabic of uh, Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan and what they do to women? Are we going to have a, some kind of a relationship with them, trying desperately to reduce the humanitarian crisis in that country and further the rights of women? Or do we cut them off? And we cut them off, where do they go? They go to Pakistan or they go to China. Just today we learned that China brokered an agreement between the Saudis and the Iranians. Wang Yi in Beijing pulled this off. I don't even know if we knew that was happening. So people will go elsewhere to accomplish their political objectives. And I, I think we should be pressuring as much as we possibly can for the rights of women and for the state of the humanity in Afghanistan uh, to do what we can for them now in the way that we can because we gave up all of our options. I think we're, yes. we're pretty close here. I think we, uh, we've got about 10, 12 minutes if there are any questions as well. Yes, sir. Can I just ask, and thank you for asking a question. We're, we're going to be looking for a question mark somewhere in, this, in your commentary. <laughs> so please, uh, please ask a question so that we can dialogue with you. Oh, it's, it's a question. That's not directed at you, sir. That's just directed. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for being here. I'm honored to be here. Um, could you address the political reasoning, kind of the Biden administration view for why they did it the way they did it? Like, the, like to understand the politics of what actually happened as opposed to the tragedy that you're describing? Thanks. I'll, I'll take a quick crack at it. it it's, it didn't start with the Biden administration. It started with the Trump administration. And the deal that was cut in February of, I think, 2001 or 20, uh, 2011. No, 2021, sorry. Dates. Um, and that really, that really undercut. It, it agreed that we would depart. All of our troops would depart. It agreed that uh, we would facilitate the release of thousands of Taliban detainees, which we should never have agreed to. And it left the situation and the status of women to a bilateral conversation between the Ashraf Ghani government and the Taliban government. Well, the Taliban knew if we're leaving, they have no reason, no reason to um, ultimately negotiate. So the Biden administration comes in. We're on our way out. Uh, we had made the, I think, the mistaken decision to close Bagram, which is the largest air base in all of Central Asia, multiple runways, lots of infrastructure. And we also made the decision to shut down all of our headquarters in country. So guess what? When the first American airplanes came in, we had to bring a headquarters in with us. That gave us limited capacity to understand what was happening on the ground and to orchestrate this thing as it was falling apart. But it also forced us onto Hamid Karzai International Airport, which is not an airport from which tens of thousands, sometimes as many as 100,000 people around that airport could get through the gates and get on airplanes and get them out. Um, President Biden made the decision that we were coming out eventually. I mean, he, he said that, and frankly, all of us believed that we'd have to come out eventually. But the question wasn't whether we were coming out. The question was under, under what conditions and what will we have accomplished when we ch chose to come out? Elliot said it. We've had American troops in the tens of thousands on the Korean Peninsula for over 70 years. And the Korean government was flat on its back in 1953, and it wasn't until the mid-70s that you had a recognizable democracy in South Korea. And they, they're one of the greatest democracies on the planet today. Why? Because we stayed. 2,500 troops is what we thought needed to stay. But we made the decision to pull out because of the Trump deal. Sure, go ahead. I think we have another question. Here. Well, this president, had, who was also vice president for eight years, so he was there for a lot of the war, believed that in, in this case, because the, the Trump administration had cut the deal with the Taliban, that for us to stay, 
it would, and this is one of the important points, the Taliban had taken, uh, had, the one thing they did do was they stopped attacking American forces. We had not taken any casualties for a very long time. And I think the Biden administration was, first, I've got this agreement that the, the previous administration agreed to. Taliban have, in fact, honored that part of it. Uh, and we're going to have to leave at some point anyway. Now is the time to go. And I don't know what happened in the sit room, but I think the decision was we'll honor the agreement. Because if we stay and the Taliban take off the gloves and we start drawing casualties again, more American, this is the rationale, more American troops are going to have to go back in and we've got another war on our hands. Well, okay, in, in time we are, I'll agree with that. I don't know that that was ultimately, I don't know. I wasn't in the conversations. I just want to make sure to get to this gentleman as well. This, uh, this question is probably even above uh, the general's pay grade, but I will ask it, how do we account for the fact that considering the outcomes in places like Vietnam, Iraq, and now Afghanistan, smart people who represent us continue to do dumb things. I'm happy to take the smart people dumb things question. Okay. No. <laughs> well, I, that, know, I, that's above a general's pay grade, but not above a captain's. You're, you're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, if, when we, let's say, I'm fascinated and much of my work revolves around the, like war and the stories we tell ourselves about wars. And those stories are crucial. They're competing narratives. You know, look, we, we in our own country will often argue about what wars were about, right? I mean, like, you know, in our own DNA, the American Civil War, you know, was that a war about freeing slaves or states' rights? We all know those dog whistles. But the fact that two sides can't agree what the war is about is the reason they often fight the war. They're these two competing narratives, and they duke it out to see whose narrative is going to win. So if we look at the Vietnam War, what's the story we're telling ourselves as we go into the Vietnam War? It's, well, there is this transnational, there's transnational communism, um, domino theory. So as goes Vietnam, so goes the rest of the world in this sort of zero-sum Cold War matrix. So we have to fight this war in Vietnam. It's totally the wrong story. I mean, the reality in Vietnam was that that was a war of national liberation. And at the end of the day, because we didn't understand that narrative, we poured resources in and lost the war. I would argue, specific to Afghanistan, many strategic missteps along the way came down to the fact that we didn't necessarily clearly understand at certain points the wars that we were fighting, the war that we were fighting, the nature of the war in Afghanistan. And I'm sympathetic to why we didn't understand that. But you know, sometimes people look back and say, well, was there any way to have a different outcome in Afghanistan after 9-11? And if we sort of you know, play the time machine game, you know, sure, can you imagine a universe? I can certainly imagine a universe where in the winter of 2001, 2002, Osama bin Laden is killed in Tora Bora. Uh, with that victory, we also recognize that maybe we don't need to engage as deeply as we did in Afghanistan. So we sort of are able to steer away from the type of nation building that we did. And we're smart enough in the moment to recognize that even though the Taliban have been completely routed at that point, we might want to reach out to them and figure out how to sort of incorporate them in some minority way right. into the nascent Afghan government so that they don't go down to Pakistan and metastasize into the insurgency we see popping up in 2005 and 2006. So sure, is, yes, you can make those arguments, but you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm old enough to remember what this country was like in that winter of 2001 and 2002. And at least in our national psyche, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda had been conflated as being the same, the same organization, equally evil. And the idea that you were going to start negotiating with the Taliban you know, wasn't necessarily realistic. But I would argue in or Afghanistan, we made a similar mistake, is for years, we believe we're fighting a war exclusively to combat transnational, you know, international terrorism. And that is not necessarily what the Taliban are fighting about. The That's Taliban right. are fighting a war of national liberation to kick out the foreign invaders. And Al Qaeda is fighting a war about terrorism. And we conflate the two for years. And it's only, I think, in the last sort of, you know, 2012, 13, 14, that we start peeling them apart. But at that point, you know, we've, you know, we've run out a lot of time on the clock. So I don't know if that necessarily answers your question, but I think the stories we tell ourselves are of critical importance. And when we look back in retrospect as to why we lost, often you can see, well, we just were telling ourselves the wrong story. We've got about four minutes left, yes. so questions should be quick. Go ahead, sir. Sure thing. 
What books, philosophies, principles would you look to to contextualize war and peace for like the generations that have grown up basically around war or been immersed in this for their whole like memorable lives? Well, I'll say a couple of things. And I think Elliot's very well qualified to answer it as well. Um, one, of, one of the first texts that helps me with context is the thinking of uh, Karl von Clausewitz who said, before you engage in war, you have to understand what the war is all about. And it goes exactly to what Elliot talked about. The Taliban weren't fighting us necessarily, except to ex 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 cause us to leave the country. They wanted to fight. This was a civil war. And external powers have to become very careful about fighting in, in civil wars. And that's, in many respects, that was it, what it was. So you, know, you start there, where we are called upon before we enter into a conflict which could result in a war, to do an analysis to determine what is the nature of the war that we're fighting. And he nailed it. We had uh, Al-Qaeda, which was an offensive capability on behalf of Islam, to defend Islam, fighting alongside the Taliban, who didn't necessarily uh, adhere to, to uh, Al-Qaeda doctrine, but were willing to give Al-Qaeda safe haven because they were fighting a much larger umbrella conflict on behalf of Islam. But the Taliban were really focused on the Afghan government. So if you, if you take the time to understand the conflict going in, then you can also have some understanding of what the conflict should look like as you come out. And that's the problem we have. If you don't have the narrative right going in, then there's no telling what it'll look like coming out. Good question, thank you. Uh, uh, I was there for two and a half years, 69 to 71, as an architect in Kabul. I traveled all over the country, I'm sponsoring some eight Afghan refugees now on a property I have on the Irish Channel. When I was this there- This is the gentleman I was talking about. Thank uh, you for your work. When I was there, there was a group there called the Hazaras, which were Shiite Muslims, according, uh, opposed to the Sunni Muslims who run the country, the Afghans. They were completely marginalized. These people were the lowest socioeconomic, some of them literally sho shoveled shit for a living out of outhouses for fertilizer. Uh, I, they, they, they couldn't have been any further down on, on uh, more discriminated against. What is their lot nowadays? Are, yeah. they, are they still are they still in that same? They are. I know the Hazaras very well. The Hazaras are a, a race within the Afghan population, right. descended, as you know, from the Mongols. King Khan, the Mongol that, that, is, people, that is right. correct. And during the civil war, when the Taliban were fighting ultimately for control uh, against the warlords, the depredations that the Taliban ultimately perpetrated against the Hazaras were unspeakable. That's what the Hazaras understand. are different. They are Shia, by right. and large, as opposed to the Taliban, who are Sunni. And uh, that's continued. Yeah, that's what I don't understand. And, and my command, in particular, uh, went to great lengths to support Hazara schools, particularly because they were co-ed schools. And we right. knew we were helping women and the Hazara community even more. Right. The other schools were all when I was there, all the schools were segregated, boys right. and girls, men and women, you know. The Hazaras, Hazaras are unique Susan people. Yeah, They're they very are. unique people. Okay, thank you for that answer. And thanks for what you're doing to help the settle the Afghans. All right. Yeah. Do, you have to, do you have time? We have 30 sure. seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, sorry if this is a stupid question, other than a suspicious amount of veterans that I've dated. I know nothing about this. Um, but watching the difference between the intelligence that we had in Afghanistan or allegedly had, I don't know. And the intelligence that we had when it came to Russia invading the Ukraine, it seemed that one was extremely incorrect and one was pretty on point. What accounted for that difference? Was it a lack of attention in the collective consciousness, lack of resources? Another thing I'm not thinking of. Um, I just was wondering that. Well, we had a, I had pretty good intelligence as the commander. Uh, uh, both for special operations and our general purpose operations and to get the Afghans into the fight. So uh, it's a very sophisticated intelligence uh, uh, effort, and I had very good intelligence most of the time. It's at the local level where it's more difficult, and I think what we have provided the Ukrainians has been less about the, the local intelligence than it is the operational level intelligence. We've been giving them some pretty good stuff. You thought I, I would only add that... Um I would say two things. First of all, I've got this lovely watch, and sometimes it's broken, and when it is broken, it's right twice a day. Um, but uh, all joking aside, I think that the 
the, the Russians look a lot more like us. So if you look at the intelligence that was, that was causing us to know that they were going to move, an, you know, move, move on this invasion, it was things like they were moving their frontline field hospitals into certain positions. Certain very specific tactical troop movements were going on that are very clear signals, okay, they're going to go jump into the deep end and do this. The reasons that Kabul falls and you have this sort of cascade, this cascading failure is less hard conventional military reasons. It's much more, this goes back to Clausewitz, political reasons. Uh, and all war is, you know, war is politics by other means. And it's the deals that certain people are cutting, the units that are just going, Afghan units that are going to dissolve. Um, when you look at the numbers of Taliban that actually march into Kabul, I mean, they, you know, it's not like they're meeting stiff resistance at the end. They're able to march into Kabul because they've cut the deals and the keys of the city are going to basically, in effect, get handed over to them. And that's much more difficult to predict because you're predicting something based on pol political realities, relationships, things that are ephemeral as opposed to in Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is, you know, we're looking at these specific, specific troop movements and signals, intercepts, and units giving orders to subordinate units. Well, I think we're over. Yes. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you very you. much.